Thanks, Adam, and thanks to all of our panelists for joining us, and Stephen and Richard. Uh, fantastic to have all of you together uh, with us here at the World City Livable City Summit. Uh, my name is Chris Fair. I'm the uh, president of Resonance and founder of World City. Um, this is our second virtual World City Summit, of course, leading up to our global forum in New York, uh, live in person and hybrid uh, virtually around the world uh, this fall. Um, today, I'm going to build on some of the conversations between uh, you know Richard and Stephen around what livability means today, along with the panel you just heard around you know housing 2.0 and innovation in housing and what that might look like in the future, and really go beyond just talking a little bit about livability and our perspective at Resonance based on the work we do with cities around the world and what that means from both a Western context and a lot of the data I'll be sharing with you is from a US perspective, but want to also look at and share you know, what that means in other countries around the world. Um, in fact, I'm coming from to you today uh, live from New Delhi in India, where we've been working on envisioning you know, new townships um, outside of Jaipur and thinking about what a model of sustainable development looks like in the most populous country in the world. And livability has some things in common here um, and some differences as well that I'll speak to as, as we go along. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll get to those uh, at, at the end and hopefully have a, have a bit of time to, uh, to address those. So when we talk about livability, um, that really speaks to you know, quality of life and I'll share my perspective as I said on that. But what I wanna really focus on today is what it is that makes cities lovable and why that's not just a nice to have, uh, but a need to have for our cities moving forward. So today, more than half of the world's population, around four and a half billion people uh, live in cities. Um, this is well documented. Um, and of course, what's interesting is that we expect to move in this century towards 80% of the world's population uh, living in cities. And that's gonna create tremendous pressures and demands um, not only on housing, as we just heard and, and discussed in the previous session, um, but on infrastructure, healthcare, and a variety of other points within our cities. This graphic does a nice visualization of just showing us you know, where those inhabitants are. And as you can see here, they're not evenly distributed around the planet. We have intense concentrations within China, uh, within India, where I am today, and of course, parts of Africa, et cetera. And when you look at North America, um, and even Europe to some degree, uh, the relative density of that population is, uh, is quite different. So the important question we think about lovability, livability, what we ask ourselves at Resonance as we work with cities looking at how to attract talent, tourism or economic development and investment to a city, as we've been working over the years with Ipsos, our research partners to really understand what is it that people want in a city? And of course, this is from, from a US perspective, um, but I think we would probably see common results if we did this in other parts of the world as well. And we did this survey first in 2018 with a cross section of the general US population. And last year, Ipsos updated that in, in 2022. And we got very similar results. And it's interesting to see that even pre pandemic in 2018, go four years later, uh, coming out of the pandemic, uh, actually not much changed in terms of what people told us is important in choosing a city to live. Um, number one was cost of living. Number two is crime and safety. And to the panel we just heard, um, number three was the affordability and availability of housing. Number four is job opportunities. Um, and number five is favorable climate and weather. Uh, we did see quality of hospitals, healthcare move up. So maybe that is one change coming out of the pandemic is that the value we place on the importance of healthcare rose, but it could also be that the population is aging and getting older, and we would expect healthcare to become more important um, as, as the population ages. As you move down the list, you can see friends and family in the area is important, time to commute to work, quality of the environment, average wages and household income, quality of the education, parks and outdoor educate and recreation. So all of these mostly speak either to the um, economic opportunity as it relates to jobs and wages, really, or to the livability you know, of a place in terms of its, is it healthy? What's the quality of the environment? How available is housing? Is it safe? What kind of schools can I send my kids to? Um, these are all probably, if we did a survey right now amongst all of you, we would probably get similar results. And I think, as I said before, I think we would probably get similar results if we did this survey um, around in many countries around the world. 
So let's talk a little bit about some of those top five and you know what our perspective is in terms of uh, how we define livability. Um, one, you saw you know, right after cost of living was safety. Um, and this is really an important issue, but we tend to think about safety as really common with policing. Uh, but safety is really about more than that and requires the participation of non-government actors as well, that we need to think about ways that we can foster social cohesion and community pride to help make people safe in our cities. You know, today we see cities around the world facing a variety of public safety challenges, whether that's terrorism, uh, you know, whether that's organized crime, gangs. So we see these graphic images about, you know, safety, and that can definitely affect perception of the city. Uh, but safety is really so much more about smaller things in terms of our sense of community. And the more attachment we have to place, generally the safer those places are. And one of the ways that we can create and enhance safety within cities is really around home ownership. And I think that's why what we, the panel and what we just discussed around innovation um, in ownership, uh, home ownership and housing um, is so important, different forms even of home ownership. Um, beyond just rental as we think about co-living and and other forms and innovations because whether that's rental or whether it's home ownership the more people that have attachment to place um, through their housing uh, generally the more safe we find those neighborhoods to be another way we can think about enhancing safety and the livability of communities um, is through placemaking and placemaking really is about building social cohesion and how do we do that? It's by creating neighborly spaces. The places that we socialize in um, tend to be safer. Again, the more eyes on the streets, the more interactions, the more people, the more trust there is among neighbors and the safer those neighborhoods tend to become. The second key piece that we saw in the survey there as it relates to what people are looking for in a city is not just the affordability of housing, but the availability of, of housing. And we tend to think about not just affordable housing, but attainable housing um, for a wide range of different households being really critical um, to fostering economic growth. I uh, won't belabor all of the discussions and all the great uh, points that we just heard in terms of the panel um, we just had. I think it's fantastic to see uh, some of the innovation, whether that's Common or Airbnb, are helping us rethink you know, what housing might mean and what are some of the models and ways we provide housing and make it more attainable. Um, there's no question that housing, uh, not just in North America, but in many countries around the world, um, including here in India, is, is a crisis. And it's increasingly unaffordable, um, regardless of the income spectrum you're in, whether you're in a wealthy Western country or a poor you know, country in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this issue is one thing that most countries and people in most cities um, have in common, that housing is simply, and the availability of housing is shrinking um, or the cost of that housing is growing faster faster than incomes for the average households so we think you know what are some of the ways that we can approach this you know again we heard some of this in the in the panel um, just previously uh, but i think particularly in in western countries we're looking at how do we think about changing zoning to enhance density um, we simply can't build more of the same we have to build more of something different um, and that is really about creating the opportunity for duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. You know, we've seen some cities like Minneapolis go as far as, you know, abolishing single family zoning and the protection of neighborhoods strictly for use of single family homes. And I think this is going to intensify. Obviously, there are a great divide on, on this issue um, from city to city. Um, but it's something that we really have to think of. We can't meet the housing that we need building the way that we have in the past. And of course, now we're seeing post COVID office vacancies have grown tremendously. Um, there's a big push to think about how we adapt commercial properties for residential use. Uh, we've seen some early wins and success. Um, this is incredibly complex and difficult to do. Not all buildings are suitable for this. And in order to make this happen, it often requires government incentives um, to be able to subsidize some of the costs of transforming these now underutilized and vacant office spaces into residential units. Um, I think one of the clients that we work with that is really being a leader in this field is the city of Calgary um, in Canada, already has multiple projects underway and you know, based on a program where they're providing an incentive um, that equates to about $75 a square foot um, to help make the numbers work. Um, and of course, there's some good examples in New York. We're seeing 
um, you know, a billion dollar redevelopment of an office building now in lower Manhattan being converted to housing. And we expect to see more of these things. This is not a solution in and of itself. Um, you know, this is really going to be the icing on the cake in terms of enhancing the availability of housing. Uh, but it is another strategy and we're going to need you know, every strategy and tool in our toolbox in order to help uh, subside some of the symptoms that we're experiencing right now as it relates to the availability and affordability of housing um, in cities all around the world. Another key piece we saw there was healthcare. It was a little bit further down the list, as I mentioned. Um, it moved up though from you know 2018 to 2022. Of course, that was an American survey, and you know healthcare is different and how it's managed and provided in one part of the world um, to the next. Uh, but what we all share in common is that populations in most countries are aging, and this is going to put more and more demand on on healthcare. In the US, we see that six in 10 Americans are now living with a chronic disease, whether that's heart disease, stroke, cancer, uh, diabetes. So we need to think about how, how do we close the gap and make healthcare you know, more accessible beyond just that critical care for some of those diseases. Uh, we are thinking about how we can take some of the retail space that's maybe underutilized in some of our cities and turning that into what we call medtail, where we're using ground floor commercial storefronts in different neighborhood retail corridors and turning those into you know, clinics and different healthcare providing services. And there's some great examples of this in New York and, uh, and, and other cities as well. I think we also need to take a more holistic approach to how we think about and care for the most vulnerable people in, in the population. And that's the one way is to think about how we can redesign these hospital campuses that tend to sort of almost be these fortresses that are cut off from the neighborhood and how do they become more permeable and how do they become more integrated into the neighborhoods and become more integrated with the surrounding streets um, and communities um, last piece to talk about you know speaking with relate to isn't necessarily livability um, but it is speak to quality of life and these are highly integrated and related and that's just access to jobs and one of the things that we've seen is that you know, a lot of metropolitan areas saw you know, greater you know, expect increases in job density from 2014 to 2015, uh, but that was captured by a minority of metro areas, you know, so-called superstar cities, whether those are the Londons, the New Yorks, the San Francisco's, um, et cetera. But what we've seen more recently then has been a lot of cities actually the, have lost jobs. They have fewer jobs in 2022 than they did in 2020. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I think part of this is the pandemic in terms of the effect of more people moving towards remote work, perhaps spreading outside of those metro areas. Uh, but the real interesting thing that we've observed has been the rapid explosion in entrepreneurship. You know, we've seen millions and millions of people move from employed to self-employed. So that affects the overall job numbers, you know, uh, within within the city. And the, increasingly, we're looking at how do we incubate and think about all these millions of people that registered new businesses and have essentially single shingle startups. How do we provide financial and technical support to these businesses um, and help foster and grow them in high earning sectors such as clean renewable energy, bioscience, tech, et cetera? So there's, and then we're seeing a lot of innovation and a lot of the new businesses that have registered are also in the services industry, logistics. Um, so there's a variety of different ways. And I think this massive wave in entrepreneurship has really been underreported. We've heard a lot about the great resignation, uh, but we haven't heard a lot about the great entrepreneurship that's happening and thinking about how we create programs to accommodate and foster and grow and create the next generation of businesses that are gonna drive our economy. Another critical issue is we're seeing just a lack of labor in a lot of different sectors and looking at how do we upskill our aging workforce that we are going to, people are likely, uh, we're going to need people to work longer. Um, how do we give them and retrain them for the skills that we need in some of these, whether that's tech or, or healthcare sectors. So livability, I think one way to summarize that, those were just a few high points coming out of the survey, but one way to think about and define livability is simply is quality of life. These are things that we all want in terms of how we live, whether you're in a European country, uh, American co country, or an Asian country. But what we're learning in particular, and we'll look at and share some data with you today, um, that's 
based on our analysis in the United States, is that livability doesn't equal prosperity. And I think there's a bit of a fallacy that, and an expectation that if we could just have more housing, if we could just have better healthcare, better education, um, that we would magically prosper as a result. Um, but that's not necessarily what we see. What we see is that it's actually quality of place uh, in terms of a variety of conditions that, uh, you know, Richard spoke to, to some of these and um, really was a for, uh, at the forefront of thinking about this when he wrote The Rise of the Creative Class and what was attracting talent to move to different places. It wasn't necessarily the school system or the quality of the environment. It was really about quality of place in terms of the energy, the vibe uh, within those places. These are the things that are really driving prosperity today. And we look at, we've analyzed this from a variety of different perspectives, and I'm just going to share two with you today. Um, but this is looking at cities in the U.S. in terms of the basically the size in terms of the number of young professionals um, in U.S. cities. And we've looked at over a thousand different factors to see, well, which conditions are most highly correlated uh, with the size of the young professional population. Um, so this isn't causation. We're not saying that Facebook check-ins cause young professionals to move to a city. It's obviously more likely that the more young professionals there are, the more engaged they are on Facebook, the more Facebook check-ins we see. So what is really looking at here, what are the things that have a kind of a symbiotic relationship? So we see things like the number of very good and excellent restaurants, um, the number of professional sports teams. We can look at, in fact, the number of Fortune 500 companies, but also museums, sites and landmarks. Actually, the size of the tourism economy has a relationship with the number of young professionals within a city. And obviously those things don't seem some seem related, but there's probably some common conditions here. When you look at museums, culture, nightlife, restaurants, things that are, you know, obviously would be appealing to a visitor. Well, it seems they're also highly appealing to young professionals um, as well. Connectivity, you see, as you move down the list, speaks to the number of direct routes that that airport has. Um, so the vibrancy and quality of place is some of these things that I would call the software of the city as it relates to cultural experiences, nightlife, restaurants, the dining scene, et cetera. But hardware is also important in terms of our investment into museums and cultural institutions and the connectivity um, and that our airports offer as well. We also then see there's a pretty similar effect here when you look at where Fortune 500 companies are located. And it would stand to reason that companies want to be where talent is, talent wants to be uh, where companies are. Um, and you can see that there's a number of different uh, correlations here. In fact, young professionals, the population size has one of the highest correlations with where Fortune 500 companies are located. And again, that's correlation, not causation. Obviously, these young professionals are likely pursuing employment opportunities um, at these Fortune 500 companies. But again, it's a symbiotic relationship here. And we see these, again, these other things popping off like nightlife, professional sports, museums, shopping, um, and restaurants. So what I would argue is that actually these things that create attachment to the city, these things that we think about as nice to have, the things that cause us to love a city, it's actually not the housing, it's not safety, it's not the healthcare or the education. You know, these are critical components in terms of what we need to have in a city, but what we want in a city and what really draws us to a place is the lovability of it, those things that connect us um, and create passion for place. Those are the factors that we see aligning with um, a lot of our economic goals that lead to prosperity. So we've been th studying and thinking about how do we go, yes, we need to be livable, but how do we also think about how to be lovable in order to make sure that the city not only offers great quality of life, um, but it also uh, is prosperous, uh, which creates a virtuous circle and a virtuous system in terms of the more lovable the city is, the more livable it can become. So I'm going to dive into just you know a few trends, and again, I'll uh, you know try and address all of these in, in in detail as we go through and provide a few different examples. One of the key trends we see is around what we're calling localization. You know, we've gone through this period of time. Uh, really over the last 30 years of massive globalization. Well, globalization hasn't necessarily peaked. It's still growing, but it's become global trade is actually becoming now a smaller and smaller share of the overall global economy. 
And I think this is playing out in a number of different ways, not just in supply chains and nearshoring or French shoring um, that we've heard lots about, but in terms of our consumer behavior. And I think one of the great easiest ways to think about localization is look at how you know the growth and development and demand for craft beers over over the last uh, decade is a, is a symbol of how people want to buy brands and consume things that are small and local. You know, I think one of the ways that we can think about localization is looking at the growth and that we've had in terms of vacant you know retail spaces in our main streets and downtowns is thinking about how do we subdivide those up into smaller spaces how do we offer shorter term leases that create more ways for all those entrepreneurs i talked about um, that are in services or in want to start a restaurant uh, to be able to enter the market you know they can't take out a lease for 10 years on a 10,000 square foot space so how do we think about taking these spaces much like we thought about co-working space how do we think about subdividing ground floor commercial spaces in order to create on ramps for all of these entrepreneurs um, to be able to provide their local product their local service um, that consumers are increasingly looking for and i think another big trend and we talked about this at you know world city in new york last fall was really the transformation of central business districts into central social districts and thinking about how do we use all of that space, the public realm, if it's being used less by office workers, how do we make it useful, not only for residents, but for visitors, um, you know, as well. I think, you know, this really requires a very clear programming and activation strategy. We've been working at Residence with different downtowns on placemaking and programming strategies um, that are really about drawing, not tourists, but locals, you know, whether that's from the suburbs, um, or surrounding areas, creating that programming to give them, you know, a reason to, to visit. And I think one of my favorite examples of this is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, where in the Brady Arts District, the investment into Guthrie Green, not just in creating that space as a gathering space, but the programming that went with that in terms of the regularly scheduled music, the food truck days, or, you know, around the green, it's that kind of programming around a relatively small public space has really been a catalyst for development and demand for you know retail and residential in that particular district another trend we've been looking at as we think about lovability and attachment to place you know we saw that again people say that shopping is important um the reality is you know we spend less and less of our time shopping in bricks and mortar establishments you know more and more of that is happening online um, so we're looking now at thinking about how do we shift from retail to retailtainment you know, where we're using entertainment to drive traffic back into bricks and mortar storefronts. And this is really about blurring the lines between retail, dining and entertainment. And the challenge for you know, a lot of entrepreneurs in doing that is that our zoning and land use codes aren't flexible enough to accommodate some of those uses. So we're working with various different cities and looking at how do we review policies and even think about creating zoning that's more flexible to anticipate and allow for uses and mixes of uses that maybe we haven't even seen yet that will create the foundation and the opportunity and the enabling conditions for innovation uh, within this space. Uh, we heard a lot from our panel uh, earlier um, and Richard and Stephen as well uh, with respect to wellness. So we prefer to think about it as, you know, was even more holistically than wellness, which tends to have a, you know, a physical context to well-being, you know, which is really looking at not only our physical wellness but our mental health our spiritual well-being and how do we think about designing the built environment and our public spaces um, to influence our our well-being and attract people um, into the public realm so more and more companies you know are starting to think about this and you know more and more public sector institutions you know universities you know medical campuses you know, often we haven't really thought about the spaces uh, between the buildings or the common spaces within our buildings and looking at how do we improve, you know, the natural light, um, gardens, and often some of the things that we've overlooked within our spaces, we tend to think about temperature and we tend to chill those spaces down, which requires more energy. And we tend not to think about enough about air quality. Really what we're doing when we're chilling down spaces is we're, we're compensating for poor air quality within our public buildings, within our public spaces. So looking at now at how we can 
change and transform the way we design buildings to ensure that we're getting better airflow, better air circulation. And that might mean changing what we expect in terms of comfort um, and turning the temperature up a little bit so that we're balanced, not only making our buildings healthier, but making them more sustainable at the same time, which will hopefully be a catalyst and an advantage for buildings and properties to attract uh, new tenants um, and hopefully at better rates. Kind of in, in tandem, you know, with well-being, as we like to think about uh, rewilding as a component of that. You know, oftentimes we've looked at our public spaces, green spaces, and designed them to be, you know, very formal gardens, lawns. Uh, but I think what we discovered during the pandemic is that really we wanted spaces um, that made us more connected to nature, more natural spaces. And sometimes, oftentimes now, as we think about some of the effects of climate change and well, proof, uh, climate proofing uh, some of our riverbanks, waterfronts, seafronts. Uh, we can also think about designing these spaces not only to make them more livable and lovable for people, but make them more resilient um, as well to accommodate and anticipate some of the effects of climate change. So when we think about this now, it's like, let, how do we create green spaces that are less formal, more entertaining, more interactive, more discovery. And a great example uh, for many of you that if you came to World City in New York and we had a design of the Little Island Park that's featured here in the photo, you had that opportunity to experience a very different kind of green space that had boardwalks, trails, wayfinding, different elevation changes. Um, and of course, not every city can create you know a little island that's you know massive uh, in, investment in something like that. But there's lessons to be learned from that in terms of the types of plants we plant, how we design the spaces. Um, that we can create uh, that social cohesion, create uh, that vibrancy, that energy of bringing people together um, in the nature that they're so desperately seeking in our cities today. One of the last ones, you know, touch on a couple more uh, here is the nightlife and the nighttime economy. We saw that in our list of correlations there, um, that there tends to be more nightlife where Fortune 500 companies are located, where young professionals um, are located, that the nighttime economy is part of creating a vibrant and, and lovable city. Many cities now, you know, London was one of the first um, and, and, and Amsterdam as well, in terms of creating the role of a nightmare. And I think this recognition of having dedicated, not so much somebody there who's there to, you know, steward the party, it's really about stewarding and understanding the policies. Um, there's small examples of this, like cities like Hamilton in Canada that realized that they had to change the parking restrictions to make it easier for musicians to load and unload uh, in the street fronts that were being blocked off for parking that nobody wanted at three in the morning that musicians could be using that, that spot. And some of these just change small changes in restrictions that um, can help create an enabling environment to make it easier for whether that's you know musicians, performers, other cultural experiences, night markets, et cetera. So a lot of this is really just about understanding the policy and some of the changes that we need to make. In most of our rules and regulations were designed for a nine to five world. How do we take advantage of that space and what are the rules and regulations that we can adjust or modify in order to facilitate nighttime activity? Uh, and one of the last ones I'll you know, touch on um, that I think is really important, and we heard this, you know, through all of our our speakers, I think today, is really around, you know, inclusivity. Um, that all of the livability in the world and all of the lovability um, that we can create isn't really important or valuable if it's not shared and if it's not created in an inclusive way that allows a wide variety of residents to access those amenities, whether that's healthcare, whether that's parks whether it's education or whether it's nightlife. And I think this coming back to placemaking and how we design and approach public spaces uh, really needs to engage the and have underrepresented groups participate in the design of those public spaces. And that we start to think about these, again, not from a nine to five or not from a certain demographic of whether those are young professionals, um, but how do we look at it from a variety of different perspectives in order to make our cities not just livable, not just lovable, but welcoming 
and accessible for everyone. So just in, in wrapping up, you know, I think I want to just reinforce this idea about, you know, lovability and a lovable city being a more prosperous city. I think too often we tend to think about a lot of these things as nice to haves um, as it uh, relates to our cities, whether that's nightlife or culture, you know, or the arts. But increasingly we're seeing that these factors that cause us to love places are actually the factors um, that are driving cities forward and really key to their success um, as a city. So I want to just wrap up and again, thank everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate um, all of our speakers lending their time. Uh, a few questions have, have come in and, and I wanted to we'll address those here um, in a sec. But before I do that, I want to also make note that our global forum for urban innovation uh, live in person in New York at the Time Center will be October 2nd to 4th this year. Of course, you'll be able to join virtually um, from around the world. Uh, we have a great set of speakers coming together, uh, three days of programming, more tours, sessions and experiences. Um, there will only be 300 uh, tickets available to attend in person. Of course, we'll have thousands uh, available online. Um, whether you can participate in person um, or online, we we'll hope you'll put that in your calendar. You can learn more um, at worldcity.com. Uh, so let's dive into uh, some of the questions here that uh, you know, we've received. And the first one is about the, uh, the Great Divide. How can cities set the stage for productive versus polarized conversations about scaling down or eliminating single family zoning? And I think that's a, a, a great question in terms of uh, how do we address that divide? And I think this narrative around it's not necessarily high density versus low density, uh, really around the missing middle. Um, you know, it's probably a term you may have heard before um, that trying to find uh, what uh, my friend Brent Tudarian calls uh, gentle density uh, so that we right now do look at it kind of polarized as either high rises or single family. Uh, and that's really the reality of much of the world, especially if you look at European cities, doesn't live in either of those types of housing that we look at, you know, mid rises, whether that's, you know, six to 10 stories, uh, walk ups, these kinds of uh, um, forms of housing, I think are really what we need and really what people want in terms of places today. So I think changing the narrative, some of it's on us to change the narrative and, and from either or to something in between. Uh, the next question I see here is, you know, are we seeing any best practices around flexible zoning uh, for retail attainment, um, uh, public programming? And I think um, some of that flexible zoning is, you know, really about just being, you know, less prescriptive and dezoning. Um, you know, we've just gone through a, a project, as I mentioned here in India, where the zoning, the idea of mixed use doesn't exist um, in zoning. Um, that it can be commercial, it can be residential, it can be, you know, retail, it can be institutional, uh, but the idea of blending those um, together is in an integrated way um, is actually a relatively new, a new concept. And I think it is that integrative zoning. So maybe some of the language and some of the things that we can learn from our, our lessons here is uh, the I frame of mixed use, um, of yes, having a bunch of, of uses together, and really what we need to be thinking about is more integrative zoning um, that allows for the flexibility of mixing and matching a variety of different uses and not being um, as prescriptive in terms of what those uses uh, should be and what the regulations are, are required. Uh, you know, last question here before we have to wrap up with uh, uh, what the time we have today is should all cities think about having a nightmare and experience or public realms are? Um, do roles help steward investment and in policy towards livability, uh, lovability. Um, I absolutely do think they uh, think they do. I mean, we've seen cities around the world um, have nightmares. Um, now, you know, New York has just uh, um, have uh, has a public realm czar, so to speak. And I think we'll see more cities uh, looking at that, that with this understanding, really, what is the public realm? The public realm is not just about livability. It is about the lovability. It is about creating the social cohesion and there's a, not much we can do about the buildings that we have in terms of adapting offices into residential. That works for some. Um, a lot of the built environment that we have will take many, many years to evolve. 
what we do have is that fabric in between the buildings is really almost a blank canvas. And that focus on the public realm, the focus on and the emphasis on placemaking and thinking about the street at grade and what happens within those commercial spaces on our main streets, our downtowns and in our suburbs and small towns as well is really what will help define and we think will shape the future and define which cities are you know prosper um, in the in the decade ahead. So with that, I'll uh, wrap up here. Uh, really, again, appreciate all of you joining us. Um, it's been a great dialogue, great sessions. Fantastic to have uh, uh, Richard Florida here, uh, along with all of our other other panelists on on housing. And uh, we look forward to sharing the news with you soon uh, for our next summit uh, coming up in June, which is really focused on the destination city. And we'll be taking some of the themes that we've talked about as it relates to the innovation economy, livability and housing, and really bringing some of those together as it relates to what does it mean to be a destination city? And a lot of that starts with being a lovable city. So thanks so much for joining us and I'll look forward to seeing you um, at our next virtual summit and hopefully in New York this fall. Thanks again.